We've been looking at 1 Peter, and a couple of weeks ago, um, really looking at the the, uh, the theme of this uh, letter, one of the big themes of this letter, is that we are strangers and aliens in this world. We don't fit in, and we don't really belong, because we belong to God's kingdom. We belong uh, in God's new world, but we're living as strangers and aliens uh, in this world in the meantime. How does it feel for you? How does it feel to know that you are a stranger? That you don't belong here. That you don't, that Narrabri, that Australia is not your permanent home. That your permanent home is God's kingdom. And that your time spent here is time spent in a community or a society where you don't really belong. You are different. You're different to your for friends and to your family. And you're going to stand out as different in your community and society. How does that feel? Because sometimes that can feel a little bit unsettling when you don't fit in. We all like to feel that we fit in. We like to belong. We like to feel welcome. We like to feel that we fit in with the crowd. But 1 Peter's telling us we're aliens and strangers. And it made me ask some questions. Who am I and where do I belong? And from chapter 1 we've seen so far, Peter saying, you are strangers and aliens. And then he goes on to say, so set yourselves apart. In other words, make yourself more different to the world around you. Be holy, God says, for I am holy. How do we, but how do we become different? How do we live as people who are different to the world around us? How do you live as someone who's different to the world around you? One option, uh, one option that um, I heard about recently, I was talking to a guy uh, who was telling me about his sister. And his sister was a very um, devout Catholic. And so she decided that the way to live a different life, the way to be separate from the world, uh, was to join, um, to join a convent. And so she joined one of the strictest convents in the world, and she's gone to Canada uh, to live in that convent. And he said it was so strict that uh, he went over to Canada a few years ago on a holiday, and he thought, oh, I've, got to, I've got to catch up with my sister. He doesn't hear from her. Uh, she doesn't write to him. She's cut herself off from the world, uh, even from her family to an extent. And he said, I've got to go and visit my sister. And so he organized ahead of time. He had to go through a whole lot of protocols in order to, uh, to ride away to the convent to get permission uh, to visit his sister. And when he went to visit her, uh, she was on one side of a locked door that had a hole in it and a few bars. And she was able to talk to him uh, through the bars in that door. And that was the visit. He also said he, they, they invited him to stay for dinner. And uh, the nuns sat in one room and they sat him in a separate room all on his own and passed him food through the servery. How do you, how do you show that you're different to this world? How, do Christ, how are Christians meant to show that we are different, that we are separate from society? Is it to lock yourself away in a convent or a monastery? Well, Peter you'll be thankful to know, doesn't recommend that sort of a lifestyle for Christians. Peter encourages us to live in the real world, even though we are aliens and strangers in this world, but uh, we need to be people who are chosen by God for a purpose. And Peter wants to impress on us today in this chapter who we are and what that purpose is. So look first of all in uh, verses 4 to 6, and we'll see here, in these verses, that our lives are to be founded on Christ and living in a fellowship uh, that is built on Christ. Verse 4, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. You see, first of all, it describes who Jesus is. He says Jesus is the living stone. He's alive, a living God, a living saviour that we believe in. But he was rejected by men. And if you've ever felt rejected by the community, by society for your faith, then know for sure that Jesus was rejected first. And you're just following in his footsteps. Jesus was chosen by God, it says. Jesus was precious to him. 
And Jesus is the cornerstone. You know what a cornerstone is, don't you? When you're laying a foundation, uh, you've got to have uh, one point from which everything, uh, from which everything is else is taken. One foundation from which all your levels and uh, your angles are all taken from that point. And Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the the stone that the whole building is founded on. He is the stone, uh, the the one guiding point or defining point that we need to uh, to live our lives by. And it says Jesus is the cornerstone, but notice what it says about us there in verse 5. It says that you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. See, we're, we're building, being built into a house that rests on that cornerstone, that rests on that foundation of Jesus Christ. Uh, Christian fellowships are being built on the Lord Jesus and have taken over the Old Testament temples. See, God's not into building physical buildings. That's not God's program for the salvation of the world, is to build buildings for people to come to. It's great to have buildings and it's great for, you know, we have a roof here to keep the rain off our heads and to keep the sun off us. But this building is just a building. What God is building is fellowships, Christian fellowships, churches, people, who trust in the Lord Jesus, whose lives are built on him and whose fellowships are built, are founded on the Lord Jesus Christ. God is building a fellowship of people who trust in Jesus. But not just a fellowship, you'll notice it also describes us as a holy priesthood. The priests offered sacrifices in the temple and we are people who de are dedicated to serving God by offering him what he wants, the praise and thanksgiving and the obedience that is due to God, the practical loving service of each other that we should be doing. And so we're, we're a holy priesthood. Uh, and, but you notice that uh, it's all founded on this cornerstone, and it repeats it again in verse 6. For in Scripture says, I ch I see, I uh, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Jesus is the only foundation that is worth building a Christian life or a Christian fellowship on. Any other basis for understanding God, for knowing God, for trusting God, for loving God, for living for God, any other basis is a false one. And if, indeed, in verses 7 and 8, he says, if you try and build your Christian life on anything else other than Jesus, you'll trip up. Look at verse 7. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. If your life is not founded on Jesus, then you're headed for a fall. As Paul's already um, pointed out, uh, we're celebrating Reformation Sunday, uh, remembering 500 years ago um, the beginnings of the Reformation that would shake the church, that would change the way uh, people understood Christianity. And one of the really important parts of the Reformation was, um, was making sure that people knew that they were saved through Christ alone, not by works, but only by God's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a quote, if you've got the sheets that were handed uh, on the way in, there's a quote from a bloke called Ulrich Zwingli. For those who are having babies, there's a good name for your kid, Ulrich Zwingli. Um, and uh, he's one of the reformers and he said, through Christ alone we are given salvation, blessedness, grace, pardon, and all that makes us in any way worthy in the sight of a righteous God. It's only by faith and resting on Jesus Christ and his righteousness, that's the only means by which we can have justification, a right standing with God. So we have a big choice, you see. Do you believe what God says in verse 6? Read verse 6 again. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Do you trust what God, do you trust in the Lord Jesus? Do you believe that God has chosen Jesus to be the one stone to build your Christian life on? Or are you in the position of people in verse 7 and 8? People who will trip up and fall 
headed for a fall because they haven't trusted Jesus alone. That's a big choice, isn't it? But if you have built your life on Jesus Christ, Peter is saying, then your identity is secure. Your identity is secure and firm. You might be strangers and aliens in this world, in our society, but you know who you are because your life is built on the Lord Jesus Christ. He also goes on to uh, encourage them further in verses 9 and 10 about who they are. Uh, have a look at verse 9. It says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, who are we in those verses? It's full of, full of good news, isn't it? We are a chosen people. Notice it's not just talking to individuals. When it says you, uh, it should be more like the Jeff Fennick version of you. Use, is all, okay? So you read it the Australian way. You all are a chosen people. You all are a royal priesthood. You all are a holy nation. You all are a people belonging to God. Because it's talking to us together, about us as, a, as Christians who meet together, who are joined together by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're a royal priesthood. We're called to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of God's kingdom. He is the King. We're the royal priesthood. You know, the uh, Queen's got her own guard, don't you? Uh, guards who stand in front of Buckingham Palace and make sure no one comes in who shouldn't come in. And wear the big fluffy hats, you know those guys, the royal beef eaters. Well, they're, they're the Queen's royal guard. They're chosen by the Queen for that specific purpose. We've been chosen by the King to be his priest to serve him forever. You are a holy nation. Uh, holy, we learnt last week, is set apart uh, for God's service. But it's not just holy individuals, you notice, it's a holy nation. We're together. We're unified by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We depend on each other. We rely on each other. We work together in our service of God. And you are our people belonging to God. We belong. If you're worried about not belonging to this world, if you're worried about not fitting in with the crowd, and you say, well, where do I belong? You belong to God. It's good news, isn't it? It's good news. You all belong to God. And not just a, this is not just about our identity. It's also about a purpose. At the end of verse 9 there, it says that, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We are people with a purpose to declare the praises of the great God who saves now, he's, he's, it says he's called us out of darkness, not because of anything we've done. You don't get called by God because you're a good person. You get called by God because you're in darkness. It's by grace alone that we are saved, the reformers would say. You're called out of darkness into God's wonderful light. The darkness of sin, evil, and death has been replaced with the light of righteousness and truth and life. Now, sometimes I do funerals and uh, people come to me, and I can understand why they say this, but they say, we, we want this to be a celebration of their life. We don't want it to be sad. We want it to be a celebration of their life. But in the funeral, even those funerals where they want it to be a celebration, it's always overshadowed by grief and hopelessness in the face of death. Because we are all stuck in the darkness of sin and evil and death. But God has rescued us and brought us out of that darkness into the light of life. What a great God. And our purpose is to tell people how good this God is. This God who has saved us, who has brought us out of darkness into light. And we need to tell with our lips. We need That's our primary purpose, isn't it? to tell people about the great God who has saved us. It's our highest honour. Are we doing this? Are we declaring the praises of this God who's called us? In August, um, there was the rural fire service was choosing a team 
of uh, people to go to Canada to fight fires. And uh, there was uh, two of us from Narrabri who applied to go on that trip. Uh, and I, as I was thinking about it, and I was talking with the other guy who applied, we were thinking about Canada. What a great place to go, you know? Maybe we could go skiing while we're there, or maybe we could go hunting grizzly bears, and uh, or you know, go. I've got a groomsman who lives in Canada. Maybe I could catch up with him while I'm there, or go to Vancouver, that great city, beautiful city. Thinking about all the good things about Canada, but we weren't chosen. We wouldn't be chosen to go sightseeing or on a tourist trip. To be chosen to go and fight fires for 42 days, and maybe they caught on to my plans because I never got picked. Um, we were chosen for a purpose, and that purpose was to fight fires. People were chosen. What's your purpose? Here it tells us very clearly our purpose as Christians is to bring glory to God. Firstly, by speaking, by declaring the praises of him who called us out of darkness into light. But also... As we're going to give glory to God, I was very interested in the next couple of verses, verses 11 and 12, uh, how that talks about giving glory to God. And it talks about uh, giving to glory to God by living lives that stand out. Have a look at verse 11. It's a very important verse. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now it's interesting, he starts off by reinforcing that we are aliens and strangers in this world. Uh, we're different to others. We don't belong to the world. First and foremost, we're members of God's kingdom. We're not running off to live in a monastery or a convent. We're living in the real world. But notice the battle that we're fighting. Who's the enemy? Have a look in verse 11. Who, who are we fighting against or what are we fighting against? There in verse 11. Can you pick it? Yeah. It's not, when, in verse 12 it talks about the pagans, but we're not fighting against the pagans. We're not fighting against unbelievers or non-Christians. Who are we fighting against? It's our own sinful desires. That's what's waging war against your soul. That's the battle that you have to be involved in. Is, uh, and it, it, talks, um, it talks about abstaining from sinful desires. So we're not called to fight, draw battle lines against the unbelievers who live in our neighbourhood. It's put up a higher fence uh, because the people next door don't believe in God. Uh, to, to even, even when we see people opposing God in public, that's not the enemy. That's not the battle that he's talking about fighting here. The first battle is... The battle within. What makes war against our souls? It's the sinful desires that come from our hearts. That's the, that's the first battleground, isn't it? And he says you've got to abstain from those sinful desires. You know, the, the desire to do whatever I want. That's the desire he's talking about. The desire to do what pleases me. If it feels good, do it. That's the mantra, isn't it? If it feels good, do it. But Paul, Peter is saying here, abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. And it, those desires can come in all sorts of forms, can't they? The desire to destroy other people with my words, with the gossip that I've got to spread around about others. The desire for popularity. The desire to be, uh, to, uh, to be proud, to be well thought of. Sexual desires. The desire to control others rather than serve them. The desire for alcohol. The desire for money or for possessions. All those desires are warring against our soul. Are you on the battleground or have you given up? Do you fight against sinful desire or do you let it take you captive? Am I living a life that brings glory to God or am I living a life that satisfies my desires? That's our choice. Living a life that brings glory to God or living a life that satisfies my desires. Because people around you are watching how you live. Believe me, because they tell me. 
Okay? Oh, I saw so-and-so. They, they go to your church, don't they? You wouldn't believe what I saw them doing the other day. Don't worry, though. People tell me how you live. They're watching. And if you're living for yourself, if you're living for your desires or your pleasures, no one's going to take any notice of you because you'll fit in. You'll fit in with the crowd. You'll fit in with the community. You'll fit in with the world around you because everyone's doing it. If you're living for your own desires, people won't take any notice of you. But if you're different, if you live for God's glory, then you'll attract attention. And sometimes you'll attract opposition. Because Peter says here uh, that, that you'll, you'll be criticized, or uh, what does he say in verse 12? They will accuse you of doing wrong. If you stand up for Jesus, if you live for his glory, you'll attract opposition. People say, you know, oh, those Christians, they just think they're better than everyone else. It's an accusation, isn't it? The accusations start there, you know. I heard Tim swear the other day when he hit his thumb with a hammer. And the accusations get worse. And they've got bigger, haven't they? If you take a stand for God's design for marriage, what are you? A bigot? Someone full of hate speech? The accusations start, but they don't stick. If we live for God's glory, those accusations don't stick. See what happens in verse 12? That though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Live such good lives among the pagans that eventually it will bring glory to God. See, on the day when God judges mankind, there won't be any accusations against you, against your good deeds. In fact, people will actually give glory to God for the lives that you've lived. So what should be our goal in the marriage debate? Is our war against uh, those who are unbelievers? I don't think our goal is to fight the pagans, not to win the battle of words. I think our goal is to act in a way that brings glory to God. That's got to be our goal. So that people will glorify God on the day he visits us. What's your goal with your unbelieving hostile neighbours? It's not to fight them. If you fight against your unbelieving neighbours, you just become self-righteous. Do you know that? You know, I'm better than them. I'm, you know, I, I, I'm a good person. They're not. You become self-righteous. Now, our goal with our unbelieving neighbours is firstly to fight your sinful desires, which are waging war against your soul. That's our first battleground. So that even if they want to make accusations against you, they won't stick. And in the end, they will acknowledge God's righteousness and glorify him. On your sheets is another quote from a bloke called John Calvin, uh, one of the great reformers of the 15th, uh, 16th century. And he says these words, our being should be employed for God's glory. For how unreasonable would it be for creatures whom he has formed and whom he sustains to live for any other purpose than for making his glory known? Our whole beings should be employed for God's glory. We are aliens and strangers in this world, but we've been chosen by God to be secure in him. And we've been chosen by God for a purpose, to bring him glory. It might be difficult at times to know that you don't belong. And you might feel the pain of that sometimes, to feel the alienation from your community when you're different and you are called to be different. It might be difficult to know that you, feel that, you, that you won't fit in with this world. But we need to remember who we are. We are people who are founded on the cornerstone that God has laid. We are people who belong to him, who have been chosen to serve him, to honour and glorify him. And we are people who live with a purpose to bring glory to God. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you uh, for bringing us uh, the great uh, knowledge of, of your call. 
uh, that you have called us to belong to you, that you have chosen us to be your people, that you have chosen us to be people who serve you and honour you. And Father, that is indeed a great honour for us because we're just sinners who lived in darkness but have now been called into your wonderful light. Lord, there's nothing we've done to deserve that call, but we thank you that you have chosen us, you've given us a great purpose, that as we build our lives and we build our fellowship on the Lord Jesus Christ, on the right foundation, that we can glorify and honour him, that as we live good lives among uh, our unbelieving friends, that there won't be any accusations that will stick, but that they will give glory to you on Judgment Day. Father, please help us in everything we do to honour and glorify you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.